Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So this video is a math for economics video. My goal is to introduce the mathematics that might be left out between single variable calculus and then what you need for intermediate micro. I mean, lots of times students will come to intermediate micro having taken single variable calculus, like the first calculus class. So you learn derivatives and maybe integrals, but you probably don't learn partial derivatives. And we actually need partial derivatives for intermediate micro because our utility functions and profit functions are often functions of you know, several commodity bundles or several inputs. So that's what we'll address here. So I'll talk about partial derivatives. I'll talk about finding uh, maxima and minima. I'll do a couple examples and I'll, I'll do the kind of intermediate micro um, profit maximization example. In terms of references, like books that you might pursue, that'd be useful here. So uh, references for this lecture are two, uh, twofold. So Shams Outlines, uh, Introduction to Mathematical Economics is useful. And so I recommend uh, having a copy of that. And then Essential Mathematics for Economic Analysis. And so that's the text that um, I'll probably use in the future for developing uh, both this playlist and the corresponding course. But anyway, so, um, right. so with multivariable calculus, I'm going to take as hopefully your starting point familiarity with the single variable calculus case. So we want to build as much of our intuition as possible from just ordinary calculus. There you've learned how to do optimization. For single variable optimization, you've got to find a first order condition, first order necessary condition for a maximum or for a minimum. Uh, then we inspect the point that we found, a candidate for a max or a min further by looking at the second derivative. That's our second order condition. That's a sufficient condition. So basically what we do is we have our function, find the first derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for the value that makes the equality true, then evaluate the second derivative at that point that we found and find out what the function's doing at that point. If the second derivative is positive, we have a minimum. If it's negative, we have a maximum, right? So again, the first order condition is gonna give us a candidate for a max or a min, but then we have to explore further. We have to know what the function's doing around that point. Second order condition is going to explore the function. It's going to tell us how the first derivative is changing around the critical point, and then that's how we learn if we have a max or a min, right? So the first derivative is giving us the rate of change of the function. The second derivative is giving us the rate of change of the derivative. So um, we want to look at the second derivative, get a sense of what the function is doing around the point. Is it uh, rising and falling, or is it falling and rising? Right? The second derivative is positive at the point we found, then we know the function's falling coming into the critical point, rising, leaving it. So then we're at the bottom, we found a minimum. If the second derivative is negative, we know the function's rising going into the critical point and falling, leaving it, function's opening downward, and then we know that we found a maximum. And if the function changes directions going into the critical point, we've got an inflection point. What's happening is the function's you know, changing direction around that point. So formally, our first order condition, we have our original function, take the first derivative, that's f prime of x, set that equal to zero and solve for x, and we'll call that x star. So that's gonna give us our candidate for a uh, place for, you know, independent, so candidate for a value of the independent variable x where our maximum or minimum could be located. We're gonna evaluate our second derivative at that point. And if it's positive, we've got a minimum. If it's negative, we've got a maximum. And if it's equal to zero, we've got an inflection point. Now for multivariable functions, we have actually a kind of a similar approach, but now it's going to be based on partial derivatives. So we're going to have a first order condition, we're going to have a second order condition, and we're going to have some things we're going to, we're going to have to check. Right? Uh, now first we have to build partial derivatives, and the way that we're going to kind of get our intuition for partial derivatives is actually around uh, single variable, uh, regular first order derivatives. So if you're taking a derivative of a function with respect to x, you're gonna treat um, you know, all other variables as constant. Just like if you're taking, if you have some function of x and there's some constants in it, take the derivative, those things go to zero, right? So uh, in this function, f of x is two x plus 10. The derivative is just well, f prime of x is just two. So the 10 part, that just goes to zero because 10 is a constant. Well, it turns out with partial derivatives, we're gonna treat all other variables as constant. And so if we're taking a partial derivative, there's a variable here. If we're taking our partial derivative with respect to x, we'll treat it just like 
it just like it's a constant, just like 10. So for example, you know, in the multivariable case, we're going to treat everything as a constant other than the independent variable we're differentiating with respect to. So if our function is uh, of x and y, maybe it's defined as 2x plus 10y, we have two partial derivatives defined, the partial derivative with respect to x and the partial derivative with respect to y. Partial derivative with respect to x is going to treat y as a constant. So this whole part is just going to go to 0 when we take that partial derivative. So uh, partial derivative with respect to x is 2. Partial derivative with respect to y is going to treat x as constant. So this 2x part, that's just going to go to 0. So partial derivative with respect to y is just going to be 10. And that basically, just as you know, our, our differentiation here is going to treat anything that's not the variable with respect to which we're differentiating as a constant, uh, we can borrow our intuition from the single variable case about how to deal with constants. And we've got something similar for all of our other derivative rules. So whereas we had a product rule, a quotient rule, and a power rule, we've got the same, well, we've got a variation for the multivariable case. So for our product rule, suppose we have some, some function z, it's going to be the product of this g of x and y uh, times h, h of x and y. Well, remember our original product rule for the single variable case, it's like uh, the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second function times the derivative of the first. Well, in the partial derivative case, that product rule is going to be what the first function times the partial derivative of the second with respect, in this case, this is the partial with respect to x, sorry. So the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x is going to be the first function times the partial derivative of the second with respect to x, plus the second function times the partial derivative of the first with respect to x. And then for y, so we've got, you know, this is a function of, of uh, x and y, so now I can differentiate, take the partial derivative of z with respect to y, it's going to be the, the Product rule here is going to be the first function times the partial derivative with respect to y of the second plus the second function times the partial derivative with respect to y of the first. Okay, so let's see that with an example. So suppose our, our functions are 3x plus 5 and 2x plus 6y. So this is the quantity 3x plus 5 times the quantity 2x plus 6y. So I'm going, to, I'm going to take the first function, multiply it by the partial of the second with respect to x. So that's just this 2. So 3x plus 5 times this 2 plus the partial of the first function with respect to x. That's just 3 times the second function. Right? So, it's going to, so then I'm going to distribute this 2. I'll get 6x plus 10. I'm going to distribute this 3. I'll get 6x plus 18y collect the like terms, and then my partial derivative of this function z with respect to x is 12x plus 18y plus 10. Uh, what about the partial with respect to y? Oh, shoot, I wrote, I wrote with respect to x here. Uh, let's see, so I want to make this actually with respect to y. Shoot, well, I don't want to have to refilm this, so this is a y there. How about that? This is partial with respect to y. So uh, this is going to be the first, right? The first function, 3x plus 5y times the partial of the second now with respect to y. So that's 6. Uh, plus the partial of the first with respect to y. Whoops, I should go up here. Well, there's no y. It's all a constant with respect to y. That's just a 0. It's going to be a 0 then times the second, 2x plus 6y. So this whole part just drops out because 0 times anything is 0. So the partial derivative with respect to y is going to be 6, uh, six times 3x, that's 18x, uh, plus uh, 5, times six, uh, 5 times 6, which is 30. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So we also have a quotient rule. So the quotient rule here is get, suppose we have some function z. It's going to be this function g of x and y divided by h of x and y. So this partial derivative with respect to x is going to be the denominator times the partial derivative of the numerator with respect to x minus the numerator times the partial derivative of the denominator with respect to x, and then we square the denominator. 
And then same thing for our partial with respect to y. It's going to be the denominator times the partial of the numerator with respect to y minus the numerator times the partial of the denominator with respect to y. And again, square this denominator. When I'm talking about denominator numerator, <laughs> I'm going to my original function up here. Okay, so let's take as an example 6x plus 7y divided by 5x plus 3y. Okay, so it's going to be the denominator 5x plus 3y times the partial of the numerator with respect to x, that's 6, minus the numerator 6x plus 7y in the original function times the partial of the denominator in the original function, which is 5, divided by the denominator of the original function squared. Right, so it's going to be 30x plus 18y minus 30x minus 35y over the quantity 5x plus 3y squared, or it's going to be minus 17 divided by the quantity 5x plus 3y squared. Is our partial with respect to y? Now we've got to find our partial with respect to, sorry, <laughs> that was our partial with respect to x. Now we have to find our partial with respect to y. That's this. So the top part, I just recopied that so we have it to look at. The bottom part is going to be the, is we're going to do the partial of this function z with respect to y. So it's going to be the denominator of the original function times the partial of the numerator with respect to y minus the numerator of the original function times the partial of the denominator with respect to y. Again, this partial derivative of, the, of this function 6x plus 7y with respect to y, the, six, the 6x part is just a constant for differentiating with respect to y. That goes away, so it's just 7. And the same thing for uh, when we're taking the partial of the denominator portion with respect to y, the 5x part, it's a 0. It's a constant with respect when we're differentiating with respect to y. So now collecting like terms, we're going to get uh, seven, 17 x divided by uh, the denominator here was the quantity 5x plus 3y squared. And then lastly, we have a generalized, generalized power rule. Uh, and so it's, this is kind of like a reminiscent of the chain rule for the single variable case. So suppose we have some function g of x and y raised to the nth power. So we take the partial of the res with respect to x, we'll bring the exponent out front to multiply uh, its base, reduce the power by 1, that's familiar, and then multiply by the partial derivative of the inside function with respect to x. And for my partial res with respect to y, it's the same thing. Bring the power out front to multiply by the base, reduce the power by 1, and then multiply by the partial derivative with respect to y. So suppose our function is z is equal to uh, the quantity x cubed plus 7y squared, that whole thing raised to the fourth power. So if I take my partial derivative, I'm going to bring this 4 out front to multiply by this base, leaving that base otherwise alone, reducing the power by 1 gives me, now it's to the third power. Then I've got to multiply that whole thing by the derivative or the partial of the inside with respect to x. This 7y squared, that's just a constant, so my partial is just going to be this 3x squared. And then, you know, multiplying this 4 by this 3, kind of allowing me to collect like terms somewhat, I get 12x squared times uh, the cube of the quantity x cubed plus 7y squared. My partial with respect to y, again, I'm going to bring this 4 out front. Oh, shoot, I lost this. Oh, here I thought, here I thought I had this perfect slice all ready to go. I guess not. That's supposed to be 3. All right, how about that? So uh, my original power was 4. I'm going to bring this 4 out front, reduce the power by 1, so I'm going to have a 3 here. So it's going to be 4 times the quantity x cubed plus 7y squared raised to the third power times the derivative, the partial of the inside with respect to y, that's going to be 14y. And then kind of multiplying through, I'm going to get 5y times the quantity x cubed plus 7y squared, and that whole thing raised to the third power. Okay, cool. So I want to take away my draw tool just for a second. Boy, I really hope I don't have to use that anymore. Uh, anyway, so whereas in the single variable case, we inspected the second derivative to determine convexity and concavity. In the multivariable case, now we've got a collection of second order partial derivatives we've got to talk about. So suppose our function is z is equal to f of x and y. The second order direct partial or own partial derivative is where the function is differentiated with respect to one independent variable twice while the other is held constant. So our notation, um, this is going to be f sub xx. This is the second 
direct partial with respect to x. This is the second direct partial with respect to y or second own partial with respect to y. Basically what, what this is doing is this is taking my partial derivative with respect to x and then taking the derivative with respect to x once more. This is my partial derivative with respect to y. This is taking the partial derivative with respect to y once more. Okay, so I've got my partial with respect to x. That's this right here. Now I'm going to take the partial with respect to x again. So I've got my second order partial derivative with respect to x. And here's my second order partial derivative with respect to y. So the own partial or the second order own partial, second order direct partial with respect to x is giving me the rate of change of the first order partial with respect to x while y is held constant. And the second order direct partial with respect to y, second order own partial derivative with respect to y measures the rate of change of the first order partial with respect to y while x is held constant. We've also got cross or mixed partials. So this is, uh, this is f sub xy and f sub yx. So this is my cross partial. This is taking the partial derivative with respect to x and then taking another partial derivative with respect to y. This is partial with respect to y taking another partial derivative with respect to x. So these indicate the original function has been differentiated with respect to one independent variable, then that partial derivative is partially differentiated with respect to the other independent variable. So here's what this looks like. I've got my partial derivative with, with, partial derivative with respect to x. I'm going to differentiate that or take a partial derivative with respect to y. Right, so here's my partial with respect to x. I'm going to take a partial of that with respect to y. That's a second order partial derivative. Or I've got my partial with respect to y. I'm going to take another partial derivative of that thing with respect to x. That's a second order partial derivative. That's this right here. Cross partial is measuring the rate of change of the first order partial derivative with respect to the other independent variable. Now, these two actually have to be equal, right? So your two cross partial derivatives, they've got to be equal. That's Young's theorem. So I'll state that without proof, but uh, Young's theorem holds that my cross partial derivatives are going to be equal. And so you only really need one of them, but you better find both of them because it'll help you know if you made a mistake. So it's kind of a low cost way to check your work. All right, so here's an example. So z is equal to 7x to the third plus 9xy plus 2 times y to the fifth. My first order partial, so I'm going to take a partial with respect to x. This is going to be 3 times 7 is 21. Reduce the power by 1. That's going to be 21 squared, 21x squared. Then I've got to take the partial of this thing with respect to x. So my 9 and my y are both constants. So that's why it's just going to be plus 9y. And this 2y to the fifth, those are constants, but there's no x on it, so that's gone. Now, if I take the partial of this with respect to y, this first, this leading term, this 7x cubed, that's gone. Uh, 9x is a constant with respect to y, so that's going to be the first part of my partial derivative with respect to y. And then I'm going to have to differentiate this part. So it's going to be 5 times 10. That's 10, or 5 times 2 is 10. y to the 5, well, reduce the power by 1, so y to the 4. My second order direct partials, I'm going to take the partial of this thing with respect to x, that's just going to be 42x. The 9y part goes to 0. And then the second part, I'm going to take the partial of this with respect to y, so it's going to be 40y cubed. The 9x part goes to 0. Right. What about my cross partials? So to find my cross partials, I'm going to take a derivative of this thing, the partial derivative of this thing with respect to y, so it's going to be 9. And then I'm going to take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x to get me my other cross partial. So that's this right here. So I'm going to take my partial derivative with respect to x. That was 21x squared plus 9y. And then I'm going to take the partial of that thing with respect to y. That's how I get that 9. Then I'm going to take my partial derivative with respect to y. That was 9x plus 10y to the fourth. I'm going to take the partial of that thing with respect to y. And that's how I got 9. And again, uh, by Young's theorem, my cross partials are equal. Okay. All right, so uh, let's find the first and second order partial derivatives of this function, z is equal to 3x squared y cubed, and evaluate it at this point, x equals 4 and y equals 1. This will give us a little bit more practice. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to find our first order partial derivatives, then we're going to evaluate at a particular point. All right, so my first order partial derivative 
with respect to x. So it's going to, I've got a 3x squared, so I'm going to bring this 2 down. It's going to be 6x, and then this y cubed comes along for the ride. Right? Later on in intermediate micro, this will basically be a Cobb-Douglas um, functional form. And you won't want to forget, common, common mistake that students will, will make and then have to learn to catch themselves on is forgetting about this, uh, this y term when you take the partial with respect to x. So the partial is 6xy cubed. Okay. And then I'm going to evaluate that at where x is 4 and y is 1. So 6 times 4 times 1 cubed is 24. Now my partial with respect to y, I've got this 3 out front, which I'm going to multiply by this 3 from my cube term. 3 times 3 is 9. Reduce the power by 1. That'll be y squared. But don't forget about this x squared, which is coming along for the ride as a constant. Again, I'm going to evaluate at the point 4, 1. So I'm going to evaluate my partial with respect to y at the point 4, 1. So it's going to be 9 times 4 squared uh, times uh, 1. 9 times 4 squared, what did, I, what did I do here? So, and then, oh, my goodness. It's not going to matter because, so you see what I did is uh, this has to be a 2 here. That's not going to matter. Content behind this annotation will not be deleted. Yeah, don't delete it. Just leave. Oh, well. Apple, I tell you. Um, this is not what Steve would have wanted. Not what Steve Jobs would have wanted, is it? It's supposed to be user friendly, isn't it? <laughs> All right. All right. So this is going to be uh, 9 times uh, 16, so that's 144. All right. All right. So now we want to find the first and second order partial derivatives and evaluate at, uh, sorry, now we want to find the second order partial derivatives and evaluate at x equals 4, y equals 1. So my direct partial. So I, I've, got to, I've got to go back to my original partial with respect to x and now differentiate this with respect to x once more. That's going to be 6y cubed. Got it. Then I'm going to go back to my partial with respect to y and differentiate that with respect to y once more. It's going to be 18, uh, 18 uh, x squared y. Eighteen x squared y. So, what have I done here? I've left my y out. My goodness. Well, all right. So that's not going to matter because that's a one right here. Shoot. Well, yeah, well, that was uh, not what we want to do. Let's do this with a text box. Text box. I said text box and text box appeared. Cool. All right. Fine. Let's go, let's go back over that once again. So here's my original function. I'm going to take the partial with respect to y. So it's going to be 3 times 3. So that's going to be 9x squared y to the second. Now I've got to take the partial with respect to y once more. So I'll bring this 2 up front. That becomes 18x squared times y, but I reduce the power by 1. So it's going to be y to the first, but it doesn't go away. So I need to have that y there. And then when I evaluate that, this actually has to be that line right there. All right, sorry about that. But I'm too far into the video to want to go back over this. I have to refilm it. Uh, anyway, so uh, we found our first and second order derivatives. Uh, direct or our first order partial derivatives, our second order direct partial derivatives. Now we got to find our second order cross partials. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this. Whoops, I'm going to take this derivative. This is my take the derivative of this thing. This is my partial derivative with respect to x, and I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to y of this thing. So it's going to be three times six. That's eighteen x y squared. And then I'm going to take the partial derivative of this thing with respect to x. So it's going to be 2 times 9 is 18xy squared. And those are the same. And if they're not the same, then I know I made a mistake, but I didn't. So it's going to be 18xy uh, squared. Again, what I did is I took my, this is my partial derivative with respect to x, which I'm now going to take a partial with respect to y of. 
This is my partial with respect to y, which I'm now going to take a partial with respect to x of. Why? Because I want to get my cross partials. Then I'm going to evaluate at the point 4, 1, and I find, okay, this one's 72, and this one is also 72. All right, cool. All right, so, <laughs> decided to just hit my scroll button, so cool. Right, so now, in order for, so now we've got practice finding first order partial derivatives, second order direct or own partials, and cross partials. Now we got to think about well, how do we know if we actually have a max or a min? So in order to have a function be at a, in order for our multivariate function to be at a max or a min, firstly, the first order partial derivatives have to equal zero, both equal zero. Therefore, the function's not increasing or decreasing at some critical point, some stationary point. And so I've just labeled it x naught, y naught. Two, second order partials have to be evaluated evaluated at the critical point, both being negative for a max, both being positive for a min. If they're both positive, this tells us the function's concave and moving away from x naught, y naught. If they're both negative, this tells us the function's convex and moving up from x naught, y naught. So I'm just, this doesn't, I'm going to go back and fix these slides. And so I'm just going to underline that. So when I go to the slide deck later on, I'd see this on this point. I'm like, okay, I've got to fix this. Um, look, so I make my slides using LaTeX and LaTeX is not a what you see is what you get. So you type it up and then compile the thing and it makes beautiful slides, but sometimes it takes several revisions. Um, this is like the, this is like the first draft, which is probably too early to make the video, but, uh, there's no other, I don't have any such videos like this available. So I wanted to get this out as quick as I could. And I'm not going to have time to uh, refilm it, unfortunately. Uh, maybe in the future. All right, anyway, so both negative means the function is convex and moving up from x naught, y naught. Then thirdly, the product of second order direct partials at the critical point has to exceed the product of cross partials. And that's important so we don't have an inflection point or a saddle point. Okay, so when we have a single variable function, we're kind of, there's only one variable, so it's kind of limited in terms of like what can go on. You know, like either the function's like, looks like U-shaped or it's an upside down U, right? It's concave, it's uh, convex or it's concave, or there's an inflection point, so like the S-shape, right? Well, the thing is, if you have a multivariable function, you can have a lot of different things going on because you can have the function coming in and out of the, um, of the critical point doing different things in different directions. Right, so if it's like a bowl, then you know that you've got a minimum. If it's like an upside down bowl, then you know you've got a maximum. But you can have like different parts of the bowl going different directions. And so like the inflection point is when it's coming, it's on one side it's coming in and then going up. The saddle point is when in different directions, from one direction you're looking at like a minimum and the other direction you're looking at a maximum. So you've got like four weird things that can happen. For a, if you have a function of, uh, if you have got two independent variables. All right, so for a relative maximum, this boils down to your first partial derivatives are both zero, and your direct, your second order direct partials or own partials are both negative. Uh, for a relative minimum, your first partials are both zero, and your own partials or your direct partials are both positive, right? And then in both cases, in order to have a relative max or a min, the product of our direct partials, product of our own partials, has to be greater than the product of our, of our cross partials, or because they're the same, our cross partial squared, right? Okay, so like what happens if this sign goes the other direction? Oh, then we get other things going on. So if the, if the product of cross partials is greater than the product of own partials or direct partials, right, uh, then you can have an inflection point. When you have different signs, then there's a saddle point. Functions at a max when viewed from one axis, minimum when viewed from the other axis. Uh, what if they're equal? Well, if they're equal, then the, text, the test is inconclusive, right? Um, also, if it turns out the function is strictly concave in x and y, then there's only one max and it's a global max. If the function is strictly convex in x and y, then there's only one min and it's a global min. If the function is simply concave in x and y on some interval, then it's a local, um, then it's a, a local max. If it's simply convex on some on the interval in x and y, then it's a relative min. 
All right, so let's do some examples. So suppose we have the function z is equal to 2y cubed minus x cubed plus 147x minus 54y plus 12. We want to find our first order partials in our first in our first order condition. Okay, so my partial with respect to x, this is going to, well, this first part only has y in it, so that's going to zero. And the last two terms are only have y in it, or better way to say is they don't have x in it, so they're going to zero. So for my partial with respect to x, I'm only looking at the second and third term. It's going to be minus 3x squared plus 47. Set that equal to zero. So I'm going to move my 3x squared to one side. I'm going to divide by 3. That gives me x squared is equal to 49. So x could be positive or negative 7. My partial with respect to y, I'm going to look at the first term. My second and third term both don't have y's in it, so those are going to zero. Then I'll look at my fourth term because it's got a y in it, and my last term is just a number, so that's going to go to zero. So my partial is going to be 6y cubed, or 6y squared minus 54. And then solving, I'm going to get 54 divided by 6, or y squared is equal to 9, so y is equal to plus or minus 3. So now I've got critical points at these four points. So 7, 3, minus 7, 3, 7, minus 3, and then minus 7, minus 3. Now, this doesn't mean that I've got max or mins at all these points. It does mean that these are all candidates. So if I have a max or a min, it's got to be at one of those points. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to explore a little bit further. So we want to know what happens at our second order partial derivatives. So here's my critical points that I care about. I want my second order direct partials so my second order direct partial, uh, let me just go back up here. I didn't have it on the slide. So my partial with respect to x was minus 3x squared plus 147. So my second, my direct partial or my second order own partial with respect to x is going to be minus 6x. So that's where that came from. What about with respect to y? So it was 6y squared minus 54. So if I take the partial of this with respect to y once more, it's going to be 12y. Now I'm going to evaluate each of these at that point. Uh, it's going to be real easy because this is only going to have an x in it and this is only going to have a y in it, right? So it's going to be minus 6 times one of these four versions of 7, depending on its sign, right? So I'm going to take that partial, the direct partial, and then evaluate it at each of those four points. It's going to be minus 6 times 7, minus 6 times 7, minus 6 times minus 7, and minus 6 times minus 7. So my first two are going to give me minus 42, which is negative. Second two are going to give me 42, which is positive. That's not enough to tell me that I've got a max or a min just yet. I've got to look at what happens at the other cross partial, or sorry, at the, others, at the other own partial. So I've got to evaluate this 12y. So now with the corresponding threes, so it's going to be 12 times 3, 12 times minus 3, 12 times 3, 12 times minus 3. I'm going to get 36, that's positive. Minus 36, that's negative. 36, that's positive. Minus 36, that's negative. Right, so we want our signs to agree. So see where that's happening. Different signs for 1 and 4. So those can't be a relative max or a min at either the point 7, 3 or minus 7, minus 3. Uh, when my second order direct or own partial derivatives are signed differently, then their product can't be greater than the product of cross partials, so we know we got a saddle point. Uh, both signs of the second direct partials are negative in 2 and positive in 3, so we could have a relative max at the point 7 minus 3, and we could have a relative min at minus 7, 3. We have to determine that we don't have an inflection point, though, because we haven't yet ruled that out. So what we want to do is we want to evaluate, uh, we want to get our cross partials. And we want to evaluate. So my cross partials are both going to be zero, right? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back up to my partial derivative with respect to x. And I'm going to take, to get my cross partial, I've got to take the partial of this with respect to y. There's no y there, so it's zero. And I'm going to take the partial of my partial, the second order partial. I'm going to take a derivative with respect to x of my first order partial with respect to y. But there's no x's here, so that's going to be zero too. So that's why both my cross partials are zero or well, if one's zero, then by Young's theorem, the other one is. But we want to check both anyway. Okay, so I've got to check this expression, right? So the product of my cross, uh, the product of my direct partials and compare it to the product of my cross partials, which we know is zero. So I'm going to take, well, we found this already. 
um, minus 42 and minus 36, their product is 1512. And then 42 and 36, their product is 1512. Again, what I'm doing is I'm evaluating my second order own partial or cross partial at the point, uh, at the points corresponding to um, our critical points. So seven minus three and then minus seven, three. Okay, fine. So uh, we found this is sine positive. So the function's maximized uh, at uh, seven minus three and the function's minimized at minus seven minus three. Well, wait a second, how do we know that? Well, let's go back up to what we were looking at for our uh, second partials test. We just verified number three, right? We got 15, 12, right? We got 15, 12 is greater than zero. And we did that in both cases. Good, so then we can have a max or a min. And then we have to inspect the signs, right? And so we had actually done that already by the time that we had, uh, so we, by, the, by the time we'd come down here, we'd already checked the signs. So we knew we had a relative max at seven minus three. So where was seven, seven minus three? Oh, seven minus three, and then, whoops. And seven minus three, both were negative, right? Both were negative. And that's a condition for maxima. And then what was our other point? Our other point was minus seven, three. So what happened there? Minus seven, minus seven, three, we got 36. And minus seven, three, we got 42. Those are both positive. What's that tell us? They're both sign positive. We have a minimum. Okay, so that's that's how we know. That's like, uh, I don't want to lose track of like how we, how we knew, how we got these conclu this conclusion, right? Uh, what this test right here allowed us to do is we were just trying to sign, uh, we we're just trying to sign this thing. We wanted to make sure it's not zero basically or negative. Okay, so we did that, good. Uh, let's see, next example. So we've got a function of x and y, it's gonna be minus x squared minus two xy minus two y squared plus 36 x plus 42 y is equal to 158. I wanna find the maximum if it exists. So we'll take the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y, set equal to zero to find our candidate you know, critical point. Okay, so the partial of this thing with, with respect to x is gonna be two times minus two, so that's gonna be minus four x, uh, minus two y, right? Because with respect to, when we're taking the partial with respect to x, the y and the minus two are gonna be constants. This goes to zero, this is gonna be a 36, and then the four, uh, 42 y goes to zero. Um, and then uh, the one, oh shoot, I'm guess I'm, I'm, betting I'd wanted this to be I'm betting this was a I'm betting this is a minus it's not gonna matter because that's gonna go to zero because it's a constant anyway okay so let's see now we're solving uh, we got to take a partial with respect to y so partial with respect to y it's gonna be a minus 2x and then a minus 4y and then a plus 42 and everything else goes to zero okay so we're gonna set each of these equal to zero and solve. So to do this, I'm gonna get, uh, for the first one, let's see, um, no, I'm gonna look at the second one. I'm gonna move this two X to the other side. I'm gonna get 42 minus Y. See what I did is I moved this two X to the other side. I'm just trying to solve algebraically. I got a system of equations, two equations, two unknowns. Just trying to solve for the X that makes these, X and Y that makes these true. Okay, so I saw this, I'm gonna move this two X to the other side. I'm gonna write this as 42 minus four Y just to deal with that subtraction. I'm gonna divide through by two. So I get X is equal to 21 minus two Y. Then I'm gonna substitute 21 minus two Y for X in the first equation. So I'm gonna get minus four times 21 minus two Y times the quantity 21 minus two Y. Minus two Y plus 36 is equal to zero, okay? I'll distribute, I'll get minus 84 plus positive 8y minus 2y plus 36. Collecting like terms, I get 6y is equal to 48 or y is equal to 8. If I evaluate this expression, x is equal to 21 minus 2 times 8, I get x is equal to 5. So my candidate uh, critical point, my candidate for a max or a min, is going to be at the point 5, 8. All right, so now what we wanna do is we wanna show this is indeed a maximum. 
So what I need to do is I, I'm going to take my first order partial derivatives. Then I'm going to get my first, uh, second order direct partials and second order uh, cross partials. So I'm going to take the derivative of this thing with respect to x once more. So it's going to be minus 4. Take the derivative of this thing with respect to y once more. It's going to be minus 4. Those are both signed negative, which is the condition we need for a maximum, right? If, my, if both of my uh, second order direct partials, second order uh, own partials are negative, that's a condition for a maximum. Now we've got to check the, we have to check the second condition. We need their product to exceed the product of cross partials. What's my cross partial? Well, I'll take the derivative of this thing with respect to y, right? My, this is my partial with respect to x. If I take the partial with respect to y, that gives me one of my cross partials. That's going to be minus 2. I'm going to take the partial of this thing with respect to x. This is my partial with respect to y. That's also going to be minus 2. And then I can check the sign evaluating at that, at that point. It's a little bit redundant writing in that we're evaluating my second derivatives at that point because uh, these are all just constants. But it's going to be four, minus 4 times minus 4 is 16. Sure enough, that's greater than 4. So if, my, if the sum of my direct partials is greater than, sorry, if the product of my direct partials is greater than the product of my cross partials, that's what I need to be able to have a max or a min. Since the sign of both of my own partials, second order direct partials, were, was negative, then I know I do have a maximum. So that's how I know I've got a max. Lastly, show the point 0, 0 is a saddle point for the function f of x, y is equal to x squared minus y squared. Uh, so partial with respect to x, why did I write 3x? My goodness, I don't know if I've ever... I don't know if I've ever found so many mistakes. Uh, I had a math professor one time who said, if you make two mistakes in a class, you have to cancel class. <laughs> and we can't do that because I'm too far into the video to cancel the video. So we're going to do the video. Uh, and I fixed it on the fly, so fine. Uh, all right. So now I'm going to evaluate this at the point 0, 0. So that's going to be 0, right? My First order partial derivative with respect to x evaluated at 0 is going to be 2 times 0. That's 0. First order partial derivative with respect to y is going to be minus 2y. So it's going to be 2 times 0. That's also 0. All right, so uh, f of x and 0 is x squared. f of 0 and y is minus y squared. That's just like evaluating this. So when, when this is 0, my function is just x squared. When this is 0, my function is just minus y squared. So what's happening is the function is taking on values that are both positive, are taking on both positive and negative values, arbitrarily close to the origin, which is the point we're exploring. Right? The function is both positive and negative, near zero zero, arbitrarily near zero zero, and that's what happens with a saddle point. Remember, a saddle point is going to be you be looking at a minimum from one direction, a maximum of the other direction. So function is both positive and negative, uh, from depends which direction we're looking at. In fact. Saddle point is a critical point with a property there exists two points or some points uh, x, uh, y and x prime, y prime arbitrarily close to the critical point such that uh, the function evaluated at one point is less than the function evaluated at the critical point and the function evaluated at the other point is greater than the function evaluated at the critical point, right? which is what we found. So we know we've got a saddle point. right? So. Uh, that was kind of just using what we know about what the graph's got to look like at a function of x and y for it to be a saddle point. All right, so lastly, uh, this is an intermediate micro sort of extension. So uh, suppose we want to maximize profit. Uh, I'll show the generic case, and then I'll do an example. So q is equal to f of kl is a production function. k is the capital input, l is the labor input. p will define as the price per unit output. R will define as the rental rate of capital and W as the wage rate. So wage is intuitive. For each unit of the labor input, we're going to incur the, the wage, right? But R, the rental rate of capital, is going to be basically the price to use each unit of the capital input. And the idea is it's like an opportunity cost. It's like if we weren't using the machines for our production process, we could rent it out for another company's use, which at first might sound silly, but remember... You know, if you go to the grocery store and you buy an off-brand version of whatever it is, 
like it's not made by the grocery store, right? They contracted with the factory that makes the name brand to on some to do some runs of the factory on you know on their product and then put a slap a different label on the box basically, right? So whatever it is, like grocery store doesn't 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 produce all these different products that it's got its labeling on. No, no, no. It's got contracts with the name brands to on off days produce the off brand, right? That's basically what we're doing is anytime uh, we're using our capital for our own production, we're giving up the ability to rent it out to some other company is one way to kind of think of the rental rate of capital. All right. So uh, profit is therefore pi of KL is the output price times the output. So this is going to be the market value of what's produced minus the expenditure on capital minus the expenditure on labor, right? That's what this is doing. So this is a maximization problem, unconstrained maximization problem. If my production function is differentiable and if profit has a maximum that involves positive levels of both capital and labor, my first order condition is going to be um, price times the marginal product of capital minus the rental rate of capital equals zero, and then price times the marginal product of labor minus the, the wage rate equals zero. All right, so all right, I use the econ language here. Uh, this right here is the partial derivative of my production function with respect to capital. Well, my production function is giving me how much output I'm using. If I take the partial derivative with respect to capital, the interpretation is it's giving me how much additional output do I get when I use one more unit of capital. That's the marginal product of capital. If I multiply it by price, this actually gives me the marginal revenue product of capital. Basically, it's the market value of the additional output that I'm able to produce when I use one more unit of the input. And this is the marginal product of labor. This is the marginal revenue product of labor. And uh, it's the value that of the market value of the output that I get when I hire one more uh, worker. So the necessary conditions for profit to be maximized is going to be, uh, well, we'll find a maximum at K star L star. So that's going to be, we'll solve this for the K that makes this true, solve this for the L that makes it true, and then evaluate these at that critical point. And so this, this is going to be our necessary conditions for a maximum. In other words, the cost of cap, cap uh, cost of capital R must equal the value at the price per unit output at, of the marginal product of capital. Similar for labor. Now, in economics, we like to divide the first order condition by price. So, rather than writing it here, I'm just gonna. This looks silly. This is like uh, in Varian in intermediate micro. This is the this is the condition P M P equals uh, omega. So. Price times the marginal product equals the uh, the cost, the price of the input. But if we divide through, we get the marginal product is equated to the rental rate of capital divided by the output price, and the marginal product of labor is equated to the wage divided by the market price. In other words, we maximize profit by choosing capital and labor to equate marginal productivity of capital to its relative price and marginal productivity of labor to its relative price. All right, so here's an example. This is a Cobb-Douglas uh, profit maximization problem. Actually, because I have not fixed capital or labor, this is a long-run Cobb-Douglas profit maximization problem. So it's 12 times square root of labor times, um, uh, times uh, sorry, square root of capital times labor to the one-fourth power. This, I know what I did here. This has to be a K. This is K to the one-half and... What I did was in this example, I wrote this up backwards how I usually do it. I usually like making labor the first argument. If you look at all my playlist on intermediate micro, I use labor first. Here we put capital first. Um, okay, so anyway, this is going to be 12 times the square root of capital times um, labor to the one fourth power minus 1.2 capital minus 0.6 labor. Okay, so I'll take my partial with respect to capital. So it's going to be 1 half times 12 is 6 k to the minus one half, uh, l to the minus one fourth comes along for the ride. Yeah, it's a constant, but this is a product. So just like that 12 still comes along for the ride, sure does this l as well. All right, so this is going to be minus 1.2. And now this minus uh, 
six times L. Yeah, that's a product too, but it's not a product that involves K, so it's zero when we differentiate with respect to K. I can divide this through by six, and then I get K to the minus one half, L to the one fourth equals uh, 0.2. My partial with respect to labor is gonna make a 1 fourth times 12, so this is gonna be three times k to the 1 half. Reduce the power by one, so it's gonna be l to the minus 3 fourths minus uh, 0.6l. Again, I'm gonna divide through by three, and it's gonna give me k to the 1 half, l to the minus 3 fourths is equal to 0.2. So both this and this equals 1 fifth, right? So I took this one right here, wrote it there, this equals 1 fifth because 0.2 is 1 fifth, and this right here is also equal to 1 fifth. Uh, so I just set these equal, right? So they're all equal. Let's just get this 1 fifth out of there just for the time being, just so I can uh, simplify this down. And so this line going to what's inside the parentheses is just getting this 1 fifth out of there. And then I decided to multiply both sides of the equality by k to the 1 half l to the 3 fourths might not be immediately apparent as to why, but when we do this, we'll see L is equal to K. Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get a K to the 1 half times K to the minus 1 half. So that's gonna be K to the 1 half minus 1 half, which is K to the zero, okay? Uh, and then I'm gonna get L to the 3 fourths, L to the uh, 1 fourth. So 3 fourths plus 1 fourth is 1, 4 fourths, which is 1. Over here, I'm going to get um, k to the 1 half times uh, k to the 1 half. And uh, over here, I'm going to get uh, l to the 3 fourths times l to the 3 fourths. So this is going to give me a k to the 1. This is going to give me l to the 3 fourths times l to the 3 fourths. It's going to give me l to the 3 fourths plus minus 3 fourths, which is l to the 0. Okay, so from this first term, when I multiply this k to the 1 half times this, I'm going to get a k to the 0, which is just 1. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to get L from this L to the 3, add the exponents. So it's going to be L to the 3 fourths plus 1 fourth, which is just L. And then over here, I'm going to get uh, this k to the 1 half plus 1 half is going to be just k to the 1. And then this L to the 3 fourths to the minus 3 fourths is going to be L to the 0, which is just one. So that's where I got L equals K. If L equals K, then I can go back and legitimately replace the K with an L and set that equal to one four. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Set that equal to one, set that equal to one fifth just from my, my term up here, right? Uh, L to the minus one half times L to the one fourth is like L to the minus two fourths plus one fourth, which is minus one fourth. And then if I rearrange, so this is L to the 1 fourth in the denominator. This is 1 over 5 with 5 in the denominator. If I cross multiply, I get 5 to the L to the 1 fourth. Take the, uh, raise both sides to the fourth power. I get 625 is equal to L equals K. Cool. So this is our candidate for a maximum. Profits potentially maximized, uh, where labor is set equal to 625. Capital is set equal to K. Capital is set equal to K. Capital is set equal to 625 as well. Now we've got to test to see, is this actually a maximum? Uh, so sure enough, it actually is going to be, but what we got to do is we've got to check our second partial derivatives. So I'm going to take my second order partial derivative with respect to capital. Uh, whoops. So what I want to do is I want to go back to my original. So my partial with respect to capital was this. If I take the partial of this with respect to capital again, or, or actually this one, right, I'm going to get a minus... Uh, minus one, well, which one did I do? Yeah, I'll do this one. So minus one half times six is gonna be three times k to the minus one half minus one or k to the minus 1.5. The L to the one fourth comes along for the ride. And then uh, my second order partial with respect to labor. So that was this right here. So I'm going to multiply minus 3 fourths times 3. So that's going to be minus 3 times 3 is minus 9 fourths. This k to the 1 half comes along for the ride. Reduce this by 1. So it's going to be minus 3 fourths minus 4 fourths, which is minus 7 fourths. So that's where that that's where the 7 fourths came from. Whoops, did I, did I not say minus? Yeah, minus. So this would be minus 7 fourths. My goodness. 
if you're frustrated, holy cow, am I frustrated, but um, yeah, whatever. So minus seven fourths is the, is the power, fine, okay, whatever. So, and then my cross partial was gonna be uh, three halves k to the minus one half, l to the minus three fourths. Okay, so if we evaluate at the point 625, 625, uh, both of our first order direct partials are going to be negative. We know that because we got a negative out front. We got a negative out front, right? And who cares? What, that doesn't matter what this power is. Power is being negative just tells us it's in the denominator, right? So it's just going to scale whatever this is. So who cares about the right-hand side? What's governing the sign of this thing is this negative right here. Who cares about this stuff? What governs the sign of it is this sign right there. These are both negatives. So that's telling us we can have a maximum. Now let's check our cross partial. So our uh, cross partial right here. Uh, so we're gonna, we, we have the term uh, multiply our direct partials. So it's gonna be uh, this right here times this right here. So it's gonna be minus three times minus nine is 27 fourths. Uh, let's see, so this is gonna be k to the minus three halves plus k to the one half is gonna be k to the minus one. Then it's gonna be l to the minus one fourth times l to the 7 fourths, or this is going to be l to the uh, 7 fourths to the minus 7 fourths. So it's going to be minus 6 fourths, which is the minus 3 halves. Yeah, so that's right. And then over here, I'm going to multiply these cross partials. So it's going to be 9 fourths k to the minus 1, because it's going to be uh, k to the minus 1 half times another k to the minus 1 half. We'll sum those powers. So it'd be minus 1 half minus 1 half. It's going to be minus 1. And then it's going to be L to the minus 3 fourths times another one of those things. So L to the minus 3 fourths times L to the minus 3 fourths. We'll add those exponents. It'll be um, L to the minus 3 halves. Uh, let's see. And so this minus this, well, we've got common denominators. So it's going to be 27 minus 9 is 18 divided by 4, which is 9 halves. Oh, that's sign positive, right? Uh, and we're, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I want to observe the fact that we have the same base, k to the minus 1, l to the minus 3 fourths, k to the minus 1, l to the minus, sorry, I said 3 fourths, 3 halves. And so therefore, we're just collecting like terms. We have a common denominator, so that's why it was valid to write this as 18 fourths, which is 9 halves. Again, doesn't matter about this stuff. What governs the sign of this thing is this sign being positive. This is positive. Remember, if this condition right here is positive, then we know we have a max or a min. But since the signs on my second order direct partials or own partials were both negative, we know we have a maximum. Okay, so uh, that concludes this here. I um, hope you enjoyed the video. Sorry about the, sorry about the typos here, but uh, I hope it worked out for you that I corrected it here in uh, real time. And uh, I don't know, I'll see you next time.